Um, so my topic today is machine learning. And uh, just before I get started, I just wonder if I can do a quick show of hands. Who here has actually done some machine learning, coded some machine learning solutions? OK, great. So it's about, about 30%. Um, so I will take a bit of time today to talk a bit about the machine learning, of, a bit about machine learning theory. Um, but the main point of today is to actually do some live coding and actually demonstrate what you can do with machine learning in Clojure. Um, now, the demos actually was working nicely for a week. Uh, this lunchtime, I had a dreaded out-of-memory exception. A uh, little debugging success session. I think it's OK now, but fingers crossed. Let's see how it goes. OK, so it's, I think it's always good to start with a definition. So what I naturally did was went to Wikipedia and pulled off the first thing I could find. Machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Now, the quote's over 50 years old, but I think it's actually still a pretty good definition. I mean, it captures the most important point. What we're interested in is getting our computers to learn to do useful things without you having to explicitly tell them every single task. Um, because in large, complex data, that rapidly becomes impossible. Um, there is actually one big problem with this def definition, though. Can anyone see what it is? No? It, it's a circular definition. I mean, they use this word learn to describe machine learning. I mean, what kind of definition is that? Um, and, and this learning thing is very interesting. I mean, what is learning? Um, learning is something which is so intuitive to us that we do it all of the time without even thinking. I mean, maybe you meet someone at a tech conference. You remember their name. Et voila, you've just learned something. And it's helpful to think about what that actually means. And uh, I find it helpful to think about learning in a very, very specific way. Learning means building functions from experience. Every machine learning problem can ultimately be conceptualized as a function mapping some kind of input to some kind of output. It can be a simple mathematical function. You can do spam filtering if you interpret the output as a probability of an email being spam. Um, if you fancy making some money, you can do some stock market prediction, I and mean, good luck with that. Um, and even, even human learning can be thought of this way. I mean, if, if, um, as long as you think of the input and output as being a thought, as being a state of mind. Um, so the machine learning problem basically boils down to taking experience in the form of empirical data and running through it an algorithm that automatically generates a function that embodies this knowledge. So a natural question is, you know, are we any good at this? Well, I think it's quite useful to compare the, or a good analogy is to compare machine learning to the early years of, the early years of flight. Um, we're really only just getting started at this, and there's lots of crazy ideas, lots of things being tried out. Um, and we've had some successes. We've managed to get some of these things to work, but it's still very early days. And a lot of the solutions are very much handmade. You see things like IBM's Watson, is really, really good at the specific task of playing Jeopardy. It's no good at all at driving your car or, any, or making you coffee or anything like that. Uh, but it's still a very exciting field. And you know, there's a huge amount of value here if you can get machines to learn how to do something uh, useful in real applications. So naturally, I thought this was an exciting time and a, a good time to set up, a, set up a new startup in this space. At Neuroco, um, we're building a new approach to machine learning, a new machine learning toolkit. The design is that it's going to be general purpose. It's going to work on any kind of data, you know, images, sound, numbers, text, you name it. Um, the power is in the, the algorithms, the algorithms that you can learn to recognize deep patterns and, and draw useful inferences from that data. And of course, we're doing all the usual big data stuff, making it you know, scalable, real time, et cetera, et cetera. And as I'm here, obviously, we, we're using Clojure to do this. Um, and I thought it was worth reflecting very quickly on why, why Clojure has turned out to be a, a good choice. Um, you know, first of all, it's actually a pleasure to use. And I think this, is, this shouldn't be underestimated when you're doing a startup and you're going to be working long nights with technology. Um, I know people, some people like to bash Java occasionally, but uh, the JVM is a huge advantage. I mean, it's got excellent engineering. The access to the Java libraries is very, very important in this space. And also, the ability to de deploy and integrate into real-world applications 
is, is very useful if you actually want to get things done and build systems using machine learning. Interactivity. Um, this is particularly important in machine learning because in machine learning, there's a lot of trial and error. Um, it's really helpful to have a REPL-driven REPL toolkit so you can try things out, see how it's working, and iteratively refine your models so you actually get good results. Functional programming, I think, is useful anywhere you're doing a lot of, a lot of data manipulation. And Clojure's been great from the perspective of building a, building a DSL for machine learning with, with composable abstractions. And I think that last point is very, very important. We're trying to build a generic toolkit here. And if that's going to be useful and productive, it has to be possible to quickly plug together the machine learning components that you need to solve a specific problem. So with that said, I'd just like to introduce a few of these abstractions. First of all is the humble vector. The vector is basically an array of double values, and this is what we're going to use to represent inputs and outputs to our algorithm. Now, in the real world, your data is not going to come nicely pre-formatted in, in vectors, so you need a coder. This is something which will convert data to a vector and back again uh, as needed. You also need to describe the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, this is the task. And that encapsulates all of the training data that you need to use. So what is the function that you're trying to get this machine to learn using some set of training data? The module is what represents the function which is being learnt. And typically, that would be a neural network, although you have the option to plug in other kinds of different modules as well. And finally, there's, a, there's, a, there's an algorithm. The algorithm is what actually makes the learning work. It's what actually builds the function to solve that particular problem. So in the demonstration, I'll be, I'll be showing all of these different abstractions. Um, but before I do that, I thought it'd be worth very, very quickly covering a little bit about neural networks um, for those who haven't seen them before. So a neural network is a structure that computes a set of outputs from a set of inputs. And it's constructed from a number of nodes and weighted connections between those nodes. So when the calculation happens, it's performing a weighted sum, which is calculating the values for each of these nodes, and these values are then flowing through the network. It's typically arranged in a number of layers. Um, so you have an input layer at the bottom, an output layer at the top, and anything in between we would call a hidden layer. And it's very important to note that it's the weights which are doing the learning. The structure doesn't necessarily change, but you adjust the weights so that it performs the function that, you, that you're trying to learn. And neural networks are often a good choice for machine learning. Um, two reasons. One, we actually know some pretty good algorithms for training them, and the algorithms are getting better all the time. And secondly, there's a useful fact that if you make a neural network large enough, it's actually capable of approximating any kind of, any kind of function. Um, so they work as a universal function approximator, which is a useful property to have. So how do we train these things? Um, you start off initializing them with some random weights. Um, you then choose a random training example as input from your training data. You run that through the network. You compute the output of the network, see what it produces. You then determine the error. So you compare what the network produced with what you would have liked it to have produced, what was the expected output you'd want to see. And then you adjust the weights. And you adjust the weights very, very slightly in whatever direction reduces the error. And then you're going to go back and do the same again with a different training example. And if you do this lots and lots of times, each time you're reducing the error very slightly, what do you end up with? is a network at the end, which has a low overall error. So it's producing the expected output of the function as, as closely as possible over some, period of, over some period of training. So that's the basic algorithm uh, for training neural networks. So let's show this in action. Um, I'll start with a very, very simple example of how you can do this. Um, this is Scrabble. This is a, this is a, this is a great game. I'm, I'm very fond of playing this with my family. And one of the distinctive features of this game is that each character, it's a word game, each character is associated with a numerical score. So what we're going to do is really, really simple. We're going to teach a neural network what the right score is for each character. So let me just uh, switch over into demo mode. Okay. 
So we're going to start off um, by defining the actual, the actual data that we're going to use for training. So this is the scores for each character. And this is just a simple sorted map. Uh, you can see A is worth 1, Z is worth 10, and all the other, all the other characters have their own scores. Let's define that. Now we want to find a way to encode the scores into uh, double vectors. Um, lots of ways of doing this, but a fairly obvious way of doing that is just to have a simple binary encoding. So I'm going to find a score coder as being an integer coder with four bits, so a four-bit binary number. And if I then try that out with the number three, I get a result here which is a, a vector, which is 0, 0, 1, 1, which is the binary encoding for three. I can then decode using the same coder, and I get back to three again. So that's the function of the coder. I'm going to do the same thing for letters. Um, here we've got 26 possible classifications, so we've got 26 values. So I'm just going to use the keys from our scores map to do that. And if I encode the letter C, for example, I get a vector which is 26 elements long. And you can see that the third element only is set to 1 which represents C as the third, third letter of the alphabet. And the task that we're trying to learn here is just a straight mapping task. It's mapping uh, characters to scores. So I'm going to simply use the scores map and tell it that we want to use those two coders we've just defined. Also going to define a neural network. We're going to have 26 inputs for the 26 characters and four outputs for the binary score. And we can have one hidden layer with uh, six units in it. And notice quite extensive use of closure keyword arguments here to be able to configure the different, uh, the different units. Um, so it's quite nice to be able to see what's going on here. So I've created a small visualization routine which will show a neural network. Here it is. It's got 26 inputs at the bottom, four outputs at the top, and six, six units in the middle in the hidden layer. And the lines between are the weights. So the green lines represent positive weights, and the red lines represent negative weights. Um, they're all random at the moment. So the function we're actually trying to produce here is going to take a letter. It's going to code it with it, the letter coder. It's going to run it through the neural network. Then it's going to decode it with our, our score coder to get the answer. And if I just try that running that function with the letter A at the moment, I get, I get 12. Now, 12 is completely wrong. It shouldn't be 12. It should be 1. Um, but that's because we haven't trained the neural network yet. It's just coming out with a random answer. So let's define what success looks like. If we're going to evaluate this network, what we're going to do is we're going to just going to count the number of times when the output of the network, so the Scrabble score that we, it produces, is equal to the actual score from the map. So that's our evaluation function. And again, let's do some visualization. Let's put that on a time chart. So what I have here is a continuously updating Encanter chart. Encanter is a great library, by the way, which is just saying how well this network is doing. And currently, it seems to be getting two of the scores right. And that's completely by chance. You know, the network happens to be producing the right answer for two, for two letters. So let's do some training. We're going to use a standard backpropagation algorithm. And we're just going to run that on the, on the network um, for, a, for a short time and see what it does. So watch what happens to the evaluation. And also watch what happens to the, to the network. Nice. OK. So what you saw there was the, uh, the score has just gone up from 2 to 26. Um, so it's now getting every single digit right. It's, it's solved this problem. And also, the colors changed on the, on the neural network as the weights got adjusted to learn this problem. Now, I actually had to slow that down. If I'd run that at normal speed, it would have finished instantly. I just had to sleep in between each, each iteration so you could see, see the improvement happen. But that's how learning works. And if I want to just test it out, let me just run a letter Q through it. Um, you can see here that that's letter Q as an input, and it's produced 1010 as an output, which is, which is 10 in binary. 
Um, now, people often criticize neural networks. You can't really see what they're doing. Um, in this case, in fact, sometimes you can. Yeah? So you can see that the Q here has a link to this node with a positive link, and then it has a link onto this node with a positive link. So to some extent, that node in the center is probably acting a bit as a feature detector. It's detecting, detecting that Q and, and saying that the high bit should be set for a Q. So you can do some interpretation of what the network's doing that way. Okay, so that's, that's the first simple example of neural network learning. Um, so that was, however, a pretty easy example. So I'm gonna, let's try something a little bit harder. This is handwritten digit recognition. Um, and this is a pretty, pretty badly written two. And this is a much, much harder problem. This has got the type of issues you see in real world data. First of all, it's larger. Um, this is a 28 by 28 image. So there's actually 784 pixels, so 784 input dimensions. Um, and it's not just discrete values. Um, we have some intermediate grayscale values there as well. And we also have noise. We have some things like random pixels, distortions in the data, which make it much harder to actually learn the patterns. Um, so how are we going to approach this? Well, let's, one thing we can deal with is the number of di input dimensions. So to deal with the fact we have 784 inputs, let's do some compression. And this is a really, really nice trick uh, with neural networks. What we're going to do is we're going to build a network and train it with the identity function. So we're going to train it to produce exactly the same output uh, that it was given as input. Now, this may sound a little bit stupid. I mean, we can obviously write the identity function very easily. Um, but the cleverness is how we've constructed this network. If we successfully train this network with a 784 inputs, 100, 150 inputs in the middle, and 784 outputs, and it's learnt the identity function, then what must have happened is that all the information that was required to produce the output must have gone through those, that central layer. So what we've done is we've encoded, in 150 hidden feature units, we've actually encoded all of the information required or that exists within that image. Um, so if you then take the bottom half of this network, what we've got is a compressor. It's taking a large dimension down to a small dimension. And then, of course, what we can do is we take that compressor and we build the rest of our network on top of it. So we're going to add some more layers on top to do the actual recognition. Now, because we've compressed down from 784 to 150 in the first layer, this makes the whole network smaller, easier to manage, faster to train, etc. And of course, this is just function composition. We've just composed together two functions. The functions happen to be neural networks, but this is this, the, the function composition we know and love. So let's give this a quick try. Okay. So we'll start off just um, getting some, uh, some of our data. We actually have 60,000 training examples here which we're gonna use. And again, it's quite useful to be able to visualize these things. So I'm just gonna define an, an image creation function. And I'm just gonna map that over the first um, 100 uh, data items. And again, this is, this is the advantage of having a, a dynamic REPL environment. You can just do these quick visualizations. Um, so that's the, that's the first 100 digits. You can see they're all handwritten, um, quite a, lot, a bit of noise in them. Uh, and that's what we're gonna train this thing to recognize. We also have the labels, and the labels are the, the correct digits that we're expecting to recognize. So again, we've got 60,000 of them. Take the first 10, um, that should be the same as the first, the first line of those, those digits up there. So let's do our little compression trick. The compression task is just an identity function. I'll now define the compressor, which is gonna have 784 inputs and 150 outputs. Let's also have a decompressor, which is gonna be 150 inputs going to 784 outputs. And the reconstructor is just a combination of those two. So again, this is function composition. The connect function is analogous to, to compose, but for neural networks. And let's see, how, we'll see what happens with this. So um, 
define a function which is going to show our reconstructions and try it out. And we get a lot of random noise. And again, that's what we expect. We haven't actually trained this, this network yet. It's just producing whatever the, whatever the, the random weights uh, are producing. So let's do some training. Let's have the backpropagation algorithm. And I'm just going to run this for, 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 for a short while. And, and I've set it up so that as it runs, it's going to update the reconstructions now and again so that we, we, we see how it's doing. Let's see how it does. So something's happening here. OK, that's interesting. It's starting to look a little bit like some numbers there. OK, that's, getting, that's get starting to get reasonable. You can now probably start to make out that those are actually the, uh, the, the, the same input data that was at the top. It's not going to be exact, an exact replica. We're actually learning lossy compression here. But that doesn't really matter uh, for the machine learning problem, as long as we've got enough information to capture the features in the data that, that are going to be able to us, help us recognize the, the image. OK, that's probably, that's probably good enough. I'll stop that there. So one thing we can do that's quite nice is um, we can have a look at those 150 feature detectors in the middle there. We can actually see what they've learned to detect. And this is, this is quite, a, quite a pretty trick. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show um, a, 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 some images that what they've become sensitive to. So this picture here shows for each of the, uh, each of the 150 um, feature layers each of the 150 units in the, in, the, in the hidden feature layer, what that unit has become sensitive to. So again, the green is a positive relationship and the red is a negative relationship. And you can probably see that some of these have sort of got some features. So this one here, for example, is looking like it's become a one detector to some extent. And other ones you can see sort of are detecting a combination of, of different features mixed together. So the kind of little strokes and, and, and features you'd, you'd expect to see in digits. And that's a good sign, because you want these feature detectors all to be detecting different, different characteristics of the input, input data. So that looks, that looks pretty good. So now let's actually try to do some recognition with this. Let's, um, again, we're going to need a coder to say the numeric values that we're trying to predict. Um, so we've got 10 different possible values, just using range 10. And let's try that out. If I encode the number three, I get a vector. It's 10 elements long. It's got uh, a one in the, th in the, uh, in the index three, uh, which represents that value. That, that looks good. And our recognition task here, again, it's a mapping task. We're trying to map. Um, just checking something. Yep. Again, we're. Yeah, again, we're trying to just map an image through to a single classification, what the output value is. The recognizer itself, well, we're going to take the 150 features we've learned to detect through our compression algorithm, and we're going to take that to the 10 outputs. And then the overall uh, recognition network is going to be just com uh, connecting our compressor to our, to our recognizer. Um, again, we can just use the, the backpropagation algorithm for training this. The final thing we need to do, and this is very important in machine learning when you, when you have real problems, is to also have some test data. And the reason you have this is because you want to, you want to test whether you're, you've actually learned to generalize so that the, your algorithm, actually, your, your, your learned function actually works on previously unseen data. So I've got 10,000 test cases just so, we can, just so we can test how this is working. And the testing task is basically the same as the, uh, same as the task we're using for training, uh, just with unseen data. Again, let's see how this is performing. Here we're going to plot the error rate. So we're going to see um, what percentage it's getting right. And, oh, sorry, what percentage of errors it's making. It's making nearly 100% nearly errors. It's really not getting anything right, which is actually even worse than you'd expect to do by chance. Um, 
But let's see how this works. Let's see, let's, let's see if we can actually learn to recognize these, these digits. Uh, the, uh, the red line is the training data, and the blue line is the test data. So I'm plotting two, two charts at once. Okay. Okay, well, that's looking good. They're going down. And the other nice thing about this is that they're going down mostly together. And this is a good sign. This tells us that we're, we're actually generalizing. This, this neural network with the, with the blue line is working on, on digits that it's never seen before, so they're not being used as part of the training data set. And they're getting better and better, and we're now getting about 10% uh, about error. And if, if you go and run this for, for long enough, it would probably get down to about 3 or 4 three or four, five percent error. I haven't got time to do that today, um, but that's looking pretty good. So I'll just stop that training there. And let's see, let's see the outputs we get. So we'll just define a recognize function. This is just gonna take the image data. It's gonna run it through our recognition network and put it through our, uh, our number coder to, de to decode the output. So the first, the first data item, I think that was a, that was a five. Yeah, it's five in the top left. Let's see what it gets. Ah, it gets a three. So it, it, that's one of the ones that's getting wrong. Um, but that's not a very well-written five. It sort of looks a bit like a three. Um, but if I map, let's, let's just map that over the first 100 digits. There you are. That's the actual outputs from the network compared to the... Uh, where the inputs, and as you can probably see, it's getting, it's getting most of them right. It's getting about 90% success rate on image recognition, um, which isn't state of the art, but you know, it's not bad for like a quick, a quick five minute um, exercise. Okay. Well, that is, that's actually the end of my uh, uh, demonstration material. Um, I thought it'd be, uh, I hope you found it interesting. I hope you've, um, also, it's been quite a good demonstration of what you can do with, uh, with Clojure as a, as a toolkit for machine learning. I wanted to make sure I left a bit of time at the end for any questions or any discussions or any ideas. So thank you very much.